Okay, if everybody's ready. Um, if you recall on Tuesday, I showed you where you could find the handout for my type lecture. <coughs> if you go to my website, kmartin66.com um, or kmiller online, and you click on Art 192 assignments, the first one that comes up is the scanning basics, which is something that we covered, and this one is type basics. So when you download that, you get a little presentation that is useful for you. Um, also, if you want to view the pre any of the previous videos, if you just go to kmart66.com and you scroll down for, where is it, typography primer, and you click on that, there's two videos, one from YouTube, which is short, and this is one that we can watch after my lecture. It's a little over eight minutes long. And the other one is my Google video, and I re will re be replacing it with this one, <coughs> or at least adding it. So, And I hope to improve each time I do this, make it a little bit more polished. Not always. I have good days. I have bad days. Um, but um, if you wish to view that at a future date, you can. So that's where those are. Okay. So, <coughs> typography. Let's start by just looking at the typeface that I chose for the words typography in the basics. <coughs> this happens to be what is called Roman. And the reason it's called Roman is because these letter forms were taken from Trajan's column in Rome. The letter forms that were chiseled into a large column. Anybody been to Rome and seen it? It's really quite impressive. Um, anyway. You'll notice that one cap is a little bit higher than the rest, an initial cap, small caps. Um, in Roman type, there are no lowercase letters, only caps. But what is important about this is this was really when it was, these letter forms were lifted basically from Trajan's column and revised and put into <coughs> Uh, medium for typesetting. It was really our first modern typeface. Okay, it's called old style now, but it's an old <coughs> category. But <coughs> in terms of modern offhand lithography, um, these were the first. This is the first font that was used. So <coughs> there are, um, when you look at type today, what has emerged over a couple of hundred years, 300 years, since the mid-1700s really, was when type really took off. <coughs> there are basically five different categories of type. So when you see these categories talked about in the book, or you see them in Illustrator or Photoshop, and you wonder what the heck they're, they're talking about, these are the categories that they mean. The two most common ones, though, are serif versus sans serif, okay, from the French. Now, I call these little these serifs, they look like little feet, little flanges that extend. If you look at the base of the F, for example, they, the little flares that come out from here, the same with the, the, um, the S, the b base of the, the R, and it's actually the s top of the stem of the R and the I. These little things exten extend are called serifs. They do have a function. They do add in readability. It does, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but they do, especially when used for body copy. <coughs> That's text that you read in large chunks, like in a book, or if it happens to be copy for an ad or something like that, or a brochure, if you use serif, it really enhances the readability of it. And you can read large, amounts of text without significant eye strain. That's why when you look at something like the LA Times or you look at the New York Times or you look at most magazines, they use a serif typeface. While today um, there may be tens of thousands of, of typefaces available, there are still really only a handful that are used by most um, designers because they are you know, traditional they have classic proportions, classic look, and they just work really, really well. That's not to say that there aren't some others that work in a pinch or in specific instances, but they're just a handful that most people use. Later on, 
um, is technology developed and they were able to refine the printing process um, and work with smaller type and more refined fonts. What evolved from the serif, which had its own unique proportioning system to, or, or set of proportions, was the modern typefaces, which then became sans serif. Again, from French, meaning without serifs. It's that simple. So you look at them, like this one here is a simple Helvetica. Really simple, elegant, clear, you know, from the Swiss modern typefaces, you know, very legible, very clean, still used a lot today. Proportions are a little different than what you see from here. These, I won't say that these are mono widths, but they're, they're not, but um, the, the proportions that are available in sans serif or with more modern typefaces are much more flexible than with the older typefaces. It's much more rigid, especially when you look at the Roman type. It's, it's pretty um, strict in the way that it's proportioned. The next group of type, <coughs> um, well, before I jump to script, sans serif is also used for just about everything. <coughs> It really depends then on the look that you want, you know, what is more appropriate. I will say this th about sans serif though, is that when you have large box blocks of body copy, oftentimes you have to be careful that without the serifs, it, there will, it will result in more eye strain. If you try to use it for books or something, that doesn't work. It is used in some popular magazines, like I believe in Us, magazine or in People magazine. Years ago they kind of broke the mold and they went for a cleaner, more modern look and they chose the sans serif. What they did though is that they used a small type, type size but to reduce the, the eye strain and to make it more legible they added the letting or the space between the lines, a little bit more space between lines which opened it up and made it a little bit cleaner, easier to read. So the two groups or the two categories of typefaces that you'll see often that are used most for headlines, subheads, body copy, almost everything fall in these two categories. They can be used for everything. The next group, or actually the next three categories or three groups, really in this day and age are combined almost into one. But they still remain technically in separate groups. <coughs> There is a script which is based on hand-lettered calligraphic letter forms that looks like handwriting. And there's still lots of different typefaces available that are in this script category. The only time you will use script will be in unique situations for headlines. If you use it for anything more, for the, more than that, it will typically be for an invitation, a formal invitation for a wedding or a dinner party or something like that. That's the only time it's ever used. You will never, ever, ever see it used in an ad, in a brochure, for large blocks of text. It is just too difficult to read. Okay? I know that that's how, how it evolved from handwritten, and when you look at handwritten letters, that's how they are, but for books, for anything with a large amount of text, it just isn't isn't used that much. So it's almost become like the last category, decorative in that regard. It's, it's used minimally these days. The next is kind of the old school black letter. <coughs> um, aside from gangs and um, bikers and a handful of other people that really like the look of black letter, it's not used much. It was really developed from the early Carolingian um, hand-lettered manuscripts um, that's where you saw this. Again, it was derived from a broad pen, you know, a, a large flat pen that was all hand lettered. And then in recent history, I mean, within the past few hundred years, um, the, many of these were formalized and were used in print. However, having said that, again, if you see large blocks of it, very difficult to read. You may use it for headlines, for subheads, for in unique situations, but not for body copy. <coughs> so it too almost becomes a decorative typeface. Decorative typefaces are almost, and there are tens of thousands of them. 
And you see this one that says decorative, <coughs> and that's the, I forget, I think it was named fracture or something like that, because it looks like it's made up of torn pieces of paper and that sort of thing. And you'll find them where they look like BBs, they look like, you know, animals, all sorts of stuff. And in they have a very particular use, meaning in a unique situation and desi design instance where you think it might help or it might enhance what it is you're trying to communicate, they work really well. But again, they only work, again, for headlines, maybe for subheads, and that's it, for just a, a few handful of words, and that's all, to help convey meaning in your design. Nothing more than that. And when used properly, any of these typefaces can really, really enhance the look or the feel or the meaning of whatever it is that you're designing. More important though, and again, depending on your philosophy, what all of these are meant to do is to convey meaning because they are used for words. So <coughs> they are broken down into various subcategories within these major categories. The next subgroups are families of type. And the sans serif that I had here, as I said, was Helvetica. Well, that is a sans serif is a category of type Within that category, there are families of type, and they tend to anthropomorphize type, meaning they assign human-like characteristics to, to, to naming the categories, the family. I mean, just using the word family, face, you know, I mean, those are um, physical attributes that we attribute, you know, that we associate with people. So, if we take that sans serif typeface and let's just look at the family of Helvetica, and this is what is became available with sans serif type and modern typefaces is the flexibility in the proportioning of that type. As I said, it wasn't as rigid as the serif, the Roman old style typefaces. They were able to do much more with it. And they all have a similar feel to them, just like family members look unique. You know, I mean, you could look at a whole um, picture of someone's um, family reunion and you have individual families and you have cousins and second cousins and stuff and you look at them and they all look unique, they all look different, but they you can see how they're related. They have certain similarities, you know, they're, maybe it's the eyes, maybe it's, you know, broad nose, maybe it's, they're all short, they're all tall, you know, I mean, they tend to look similar in some respects. Um, there are certain you know, elements of them that look the same. Well, that would be the true, hold true when you look at a family of type and using Helvetica, we'll see here, and I don't even have all of the categories or the, the family, I'm sorry, the faces available within Helvetica. But I started at one end with condensed bold, then we have condensed black, we have ultra light, ultra light italic, light, light italic, regular italic, bold, bold italic, and we have con you know extended type faces that we can use, um, which actually stretch it out widthwise. And there's a whole slew more that I could have put in here, and they all, as I say, look very similar to one or one another, but different. So one of the things that you might consider when you're designing. And again, this is kind of an old school in design, is that oftentimes you don't need more than one or two type um, faces within a design. More than that get, can be very confusing. And oftentimes, if you're not sure what type faces to use, if you stick within the same type family, but you use different weights or different faces within that family, you can be assured they will work together, just like when you're working with color, and if you're not familiar with color, if you work with analogous colors or you work with complementary colors, they work together quite nicely. The same holds true for these. Um, that if you work within the same family of type and just work with different weights, you know, maybe the heavier weights will be used for your headlines, and maybe for subheads you will use an italic typeface, and for your body copy you'll, you'll use a regular typeface. So you've used three different typefaces, <coughs> but they're all within the same family, and they all kind of g like glue, they hold together. Does that make sense? They look similar to one another. Now, within each of these faces that we see, <coughs> okay, 
there is what is called a font. And you see the font used all the time in Photoshop and Illustrator. And it says, which font do you want to choose? Well, what that means is within this particular family, Helvetica, we're looking at a particular face. And I look at regular. Within regular, we have all of the capital letters, all of the lowercase letters. We have the numerals, and we have the special characters, and there's ligatures, and there's more that were all designed with this typeface and this weight in mind. And they are unique. They may look similar to one another, but when you start comparing letter form for letter, for letter form, when it's designed properly, each letter form was really carefully structured and designed to work with the others and to um, work for mostly for legibility, for readability, to really work really well um, on its own. So when you look at the different fonts, and you'll see that some of the typefaces, like Helvetica, if they're installed, you will have many more fonts available to you. When you look at some of the older typefaces, um, oftentimes there were fewer fonts available to you. That they just, especially with the older serif ones, it doesn't matter from whom you buy it. Um, there are just not as many you know, variations that you have to work with when you design. Now, when we study the parts of letter forms, <coughs> again, they use human traits to describe or explain some of the parts. And let's start here, that typically with the, the baseline here. Um, baseline isn't a body part, but when they talk about body copy, the body, you know, the core of, of you know, what it is that you're designing or your, the text um, refers to human form. But anyway, you'll see when you're typing text in Illustrator, as you're typing it, you'll see a light blue or a lightly colored, whatever, depending on the layer you're on, line underneath the text. And that is called the baseline, that all of the text rests on that. And we have the tools to move it up or to move it below the, the baseline. Some of the things that you'll notice, and it's not a mistake, that, for example, if you look at any of the cursive or the rounded forms, notice how the O hangs slightly below the baseline down here. And also look at how the, the bowl of the D hangs just below the baseline. Well, that's not a mistake. Optically, when you look at it, if I were to actually raise this above and have it rest exactly on the, the baseline, it would look like it was too high. So each of the, the letter forms, based on how they're structured, are positioned the way they're supposed to be. That they look like they all rest on the baseline, but based on you know, how they're constructed, um, they may actually hang below in some instances, as you see here. Similarly, when you're, you want all of the text to be flush left, sometimes some of it will hang over just a little bit. Similar to it with the O's, because there's so much empty space around it, you need to push it over a bit to make it look like it's actually on the line. When you have, on the other hand, a lot of vertical strokes or horizontal strokes, they will rest exactly on the line. That's where, on the baseline, that's where they'll rest. The next, um, I guess that what I should talk about is to talk about caps and lowercase. You'll notice that we have capital letters and we have small letters. Well, they're also called uppercase and lowercase, um, as well as um, capital letters and small letters. The reason they were called uppercase and lowercase had to do in, in the old days, literally in the 1800s, when typesetters would take the lead type that they used to set and to put it in a block. The capital letters were in cases that were upper, and you know they were above, physically above. And the small letters were in lower, lower cases. They were positioned below. And they would take each of those letters, and they would pack them in a case, and they would tighten them up. Anybody been back east um, to either Williamsburg and seen the, the old printing press or gone to um, Philadelphia and seen where um, uh, Frank, Benjamin Franklin had his press set up. And you can see how they actually set all of the type and worked 
the way they did years ago. Anyway, that's where those terms came from, uppercase, lowercase, capital letters, small letters. Um, you'll notice with the small letters that they, that they ride, there's, and this will vary on how the type is designed, but they generally are about the midpoint in here between the baseline and the, the top of the A center here, which I'll talk about in a second. The line that runs across the middle here is called the waistline. And then um, we'll talk about cap height or the, the top of the, the line here. Um, but <coughs> anything that extends above the waistline is called the uh, ascender. It's for the lowercase letters. And anything that extends below the baseline is called a descender. Okay, so when you measure from the baseline to the waistline, that would be called the X height, and that is a measurement that's used in design often. Um, oftentimes, you think of the size of type, you think of it from the baseline to the top of the capital letter, and that's not the case. You can specify that you want a cap height to be a certain size, but that's not how type is measured. How type is measured is from the top of the A center to the bottom of the D center. And you'll notice in this particular instance, I believe I used Times Roman here, um, that the top of the A center extends just above the cap height a little bit. So if I said that this was 60 point type or I said it was 12 point type or whatever, however I measured it, it's measured from this top line here down here. So you may look at different typefaces and you'll notice that they will be the same type size, but they will look different in height. And that's because they're designed differently. The caps may be different relative to the lowercase letters and so on and so forth. Sometimes the A centers really extend far above the top of the caps. Likewise, the D centers sometimes can extend really far below the baseline and that affects how the type is measured um, um, quite a bit, specific, especially when the X height is fairly small. And you'll notice wide ranges in, in how the same, how different typefaces look, even though they are technically the same size. Okay? Um, so those are the parts. And there are more parts to this, like this empty space in the middle of the O is called a counter. And there's legs and stems and all kinds of stuff that we could talk about, and bowls and whatever else. The next point I want to make is to um, let you know how type is measured. And this is standardized. This was used way before computers. And it, when uh, um, computers came out, and, and especially Adobe Illustrator in 1988, they just adopted all the standards of traditional type. So typically type as well as ruled lines are measured in points and picas, especially points. And points and picas are just a unit of measurement the same way inches are in, in feet and yards are a unit of or units of measurement as are millimeters, meters, kilometers are a unit of measurement or units of measurement. And how points and picas relate to inches is pretty simple. 12 points equal one pica. And six picas equal one inch. So if you do the math, you multiply six times 12, then that means there are 72 points in one inch. And while that is a small unit of measurement, trust me that when, you're using, that when you use different types, sizes, and you switch from 12 point to 11 point, there is a marked visual difference between those two type sizes. It's only one, one seven, it's only one, 72nd of an inch difference, but believe me, it is a really remarkable difference. You'll find designers arguing over whether they should use four, five, maybe six point type. You know, that typically designers like minimalists want really small type in some instances, and they'll argue between four and five point. You think, well, what's the difference? It's one 72nd of an inch. But when you look at them side by side, you can really tell the difference. Which one is better depends on the individual situation. Okay, <coughs> And as I mentioned a moment ago, the type size, when you do measure it, it's from 
the distance from the top of the A center to the bottom of the D center. That's how the type is measured. So it varies from font to font. It varies from um, typeface to typeface, you know, whichever, you know, based on its design. And also, as I mentioned a moment ago, some other nomenclature, um, the terms that are used. Capital letters are also called uppercase, sometimes UC. And the small letters are also known as lowercase, and I give you a little history of that, or LC. And then there are ways, and it's done automatically when you use um, most word processing programs or um, desktop publishing programs like InDesign or Quark Express or Illustrator or any number of programs that when you use the keyboard to type a line of type or a block of type, the spacing is automatic. But <coughs> you will find, off, find oftentimes, especially in headlines, that sometimes the letters will look too close together or too far apart <coughs> based on the uniqueness of, of the way the letters <coughs> are juxtaposed against one another. <coughs> and so what you want to do is selectively adjust between words or between letters the space. And that is called kerning. <coughs> And there are tools in Illustrator that allow you to adjust that, be very precise. In addition to that, you may want to uniformly stretch out the letters within a line of type or a word to spread across a larger distance or maybe a shorter distance. And that is called tracking. And there are tools inside Illustrator for that that allow you to adjust the tracking of text that you set. In addition to that, you'll want to adjust oftentimes the space between lines of type. Again, it's done automatically for you, but <coughs> what that is called is letting. And again, just like the uppercase and the lowercase, that came from the old days when type was handset and they used little slivers of lead between lines of type to increase the space between those lines. So that's where letting came from, the term. And that's still used today. And you can come back and you can set type, individual lines of type, and adjust the space in very small increments between one another. Expand and make it more space or reduce and make less space between th the lines. Typically when you're designing a magazine <coughs> or you're designing an ad or wh whatever, there are various parts to it that are pretty standard. And what I'm showing you here is this, and it doesn't have to be this way, but it's kind of like the default size relationship. You'll see in the masthead here, or the headline, that it's typically the largest, the most dominant, and it also sits at the top. That's not always the case, but that's the easiest <coughs> to think of. And then <coughs> underneath that headline, or the masthead, you'll have subheads, and they can be close to the same size or significantly smaller. But they're the next size down, subhead. And then the smallest is the body copy. And I have in the next group here, the typical size ranges. <coughs> body copy generally starts at eight point type and goes up to close to 13 point, depending on the typeface that, you're cho that you have chosen depending on relative sizes to the, the rest of the type and, and whatever it is, document that you've designed. Um, the column widths also vary significantly too. Typically the smallest column width is 13.6 picas and it ranges up to 48. If it's any smaller than 13.6 picas or 13 and a half picas, it's too, it looks too small and 13.6 is generally for a three column ad or if you look at the size of the columns inside most newspapers, they're typically that width because they're easy to track. If you want wider columns, I would not make them any broader or any wider than 48 picas because they'll, if they're too long, have you ever noticed that it's really hard for you to for your eyes to follow a line, and when you're done, to come back and to track the next line down. So if it's any wider than 48 picas, and that's really a lot, 48. 
it's really hard to follow from one line to the next. So you don't want the line widths to be any, wi any wider than that. If you find that you need more, then just break your text down into multiple columns like they do in newspapers. You know, they don't have one string of text that goes across the whole top of the newspaper except for a headline, which is just a handful of words. You know, just a couple of words and that's it. But for body copy, these are pretty much the, the standard rules of thumb. Subheads start generally around 14 point, go up to 18 point. This varies depending on the rest of the ad that you're designing. And headlines typically start at 24 point and can be as big as you, they need to be. Again, depending on <coughs> what kind of document it is you're designing. Whether it's a teeny tiny brochure or a large ad or a poster, the size relationships vary. But these are the general, depending on these, these different categories, these are the general size relationships that you'll see. And that is that. So this is a standard. Now, what I also wanted to show you, <coughs> as I said, when we come back up here, <coughs> let me put, let me go to my home page here. And I'm going to go to the typography um, article that I wrote some time ago, about a year ago. Um, typography primer. And what I would like to do is play this for you. Now, I showed you the basics, but <coughs> in this typography lecture, he shows you how to <coughs> use type more as a design element, where instead of that strict hierarchical fashion where I said headlines are the biggest and they're at the top, then subheads are smaller, and the text or the body copy is smaller yet, and it's lowered on the food chain. He will mix them up here and show you a variety of ways of designing and interchanging it, but the, the way you, you read the document really isn't all that different, but even though he changes the size of the copy versus the headline and so on and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and play this and see if it plays through nicely. And I'll, I better turn on the sound here so you can hear it. <coughs> so it's a nice little piece. And there's others that you can find on YouTube too. But I thought this was particularly nice. And I think it was taken from lynda.com at one point. Hope it comes up. We'll find out in a minute. Oh no, Mr. Bill, don't do that. It's not available anymore. Oh, I guess we won't see it. I'll have to look for something else then. Okay, my apologies. I posted this a year ago and I thought this would be on YouTube for a while and it's not. So it's not available anymore. Sorry about that. I'll hunt for another one. OK. So those are the basics of typography. Next Tuesday when you come in and I start to do the, the next exercise, I will um, show you all the tools in, in, in Illustrator that enable you to tweak every aspect of type. They can make you do some really elegant things with it, and they can allow you to really mess it up, too, you know, so if you're not careful. But there's lots of tools, and as I have also stressed, too, in the past, that Illustrator, I think of all the, the programs, gives you the best tools to work with type. You can really do some amazing things with it, some very powerful tools, more than, definitely more than Photoshop in more than most other desktop publishing programs, definitely. So for designing custom logos and headlines and unique, you know, type, um, for unique type uses, um, Illustrator is definitely the way to go. Some really, really nice stuff that you can do with it. Okay, so that's all I have to say about that. So th if anybody, if you're ready to print your beach scene, let me know. I'll crank up the printer and we can print it. Remember what I showed you the other day, you need to also burn the file on a CD first. And you turn that in, you get a manila envelope like so. 
and you take the printed piece and put it in here, put it, the CD in here. Make sure your name, date, class, and assignment are on here. And then you just hand it in. And if you need to or you want to print extra copies for yourself, by all means. Um, the same it goes for burning extra copies on the CD, on, a, you know, on another CD for yourself to archive it and to back it up. Okay? So that's all I wanted to talk about today.